quick one before this episode of the F2 show starts. Completely shameless plug. If you haven't done so already, press the subscribe button. We're trying to reach 100,000 subscribers this year, so we'd be incredibly grateful for any support that you could show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Enjoy the podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the F2 show by Inside F2. Have you got your breath back? What a weekend of Formula 2 action. And joining me to reflect on all of the action from this weekend, as always, Aaron Harper and Lawrence Griffin. And chaps, we're going to talk about an incredible feature race. We're going to talk about some uh, some rookies and how they did this weekend. But there's only one place to start, and that is Oli Behrman. Um, obviously, P22 in the championship, absolutely washed. He needs to sort his game out. No, I'm joking, of course, I'm joking. He, of course, got a last-minute call-up for Ferrari, didn't he? Uh, and he was absolutely superb, Aaron, wasn't he? Hey, he was fantastic. He did everything and more you could have expected from him. For me, the fact that he finished the race is testament to how well Formula 2 actually prepares young drivers. For him to jump into a Ferrari, a front-running car and deal with it speaks volumes about obviously the the series and how it prepares drivers, but also him as a racing driver and as a person, because he could have done a really good first in and then got a bit tired, a few mistakes, run wide, you know, the pace generally dropping off. Maybe the neck had gone a little bit because these are intense G forces that he's not been subjected to for that long in like that intense environment. You know, it's just a fantastic result to go and score points as well and finish ahead of a multiple world champion who's mm. going to be in that car next year. Just unbelievable. Fair play. Clap it up. Clap it up for Ollie Behrman. Yeah, definitely. It was absolutely brilliant. And Lawrence, p- particularly, as I was just mentioned, considering he only jumped in the car on Saturday, he didn't get that or oh, on Friday, even I get the days right. Uh, he didn't get that practice time on 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 Thursday. He didn't get FP one and FP two. Uh, he literally had one hour of practice, and then it was straight into qualifying. That the pressure on him, uh, yeah, it, to to perform like he did was yeah, it's superb, really, isn't that? Yeah, uh, unbelievable. I think a real combination of talent mixed with you know maybe not preparation on the day, but pre preparation in terms of someone that's worked with that Ferrari team in the past who has driven Formula One cars of the past. So maybe that would have helped him in FP3 because I think, to be honest, if he didn't have any experience with the team, he'd spend all of FP3 just learning where all the buttons were and what they all did. You know, driving a Formula One car, you know, a modern Formula One car is incredibly complex. And then to get your heads around the systems, to then be able to drive consistently around Jeddah where you, you have no choice but to push it to the limit. If you're not doing that, you're going to be way out the back of the field. And to see his attitude, the way he applied himself, he didn't really leave any margin out there. He pushed hard in, in quali, you know, and probably made a slight error in, in, in Q2, which meant that he didn't quite get through to Q3. But the fact that he was willing to go and take those risks was was brilliant. And he was so aggressive in the race, you know, throwing a, the dummy on Sonoda at turn one, looking to the outside, cutting back into the inside, you know, Ricardo on Vettel at, at Monza-esque. You know, it's it's done him the world of good for his for his reputation in Formula One, no doubt. And there'll be a lot of people, especially people in that Ferrari team, that will take a note of that. I just think it's amazing that you've got a driver who's P22 in the F2 standings and uh, he's now top 10 in the F1 standings um, and uh, finishing ahead of a, a seven-time world champion. Uh, yeah, absolutely brilliant. And it's a great weekend for Formula 2 in general, Aaron, in that it just goes to show that, you know, how capable these drivers are, that they can step up from F2 straight into F1 and they can do the job straight away, right? Yeah, I'm not, I can't remember who said it on Sky Sports commentary. I think it might have been uh, Karen Chandock. Who, who mentioned it, it makes all the F1 teams look a bit silly for not having a rookie in one of their teams. These drivers are clearly capable. Terry Porcher is the F2 champion and is clearly F1 quality. Felipe Drogovic is still waiting for his F1 debut. Oscar Piastri has shown that you can jump in and do the business. Yeah, Oli Behrman awesome. has proven it as well. So, These F2 drivers that are coming through, the ones that are at the top of the championship are definitely ready and capable to deal with a Formula One car. Obviously, the the strains and stresses of an entire season, it might you might see some hiccups here and there. We've seen it before, and that's to be accepted and probably expected um, for a rookie coming from F2, especially in the first season. Logan Sargent last year 
did have his struggles, but seemed to be getting it together. So it's definitely, you know, the door needs to be open a bit more for F2 drivers. I think we've been we've been speaking about this sort of privately and in on social media a long time as F1 and motorsport fans. There needs to be more opportunity for young drivers to come through. It is complicated by the fact that you've got two of the greats still clogging up <laughs> seats at the ripe old age of their 40s in Hamilton and, and Alonso, but they're also still doing the business. So it, it's 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 a balancing act, but then it does just play into this wider argument of there needs to be more seats available. So that's a whole different minefield, and we will stay well away from that today. <laughs> and and, and you, look, you look at, you know, even, even just things like Behrman didn't didn't crash at all this weekend and was able to to keep it clean and, you know you look, you look at you know someone like Lance Stroll who was what a good seven tenths off his teammates and and you know managed to crash I think was in in, in you know in the same place that our sergeant did in FP1 you know it experienced drivers get it wrong around around Jeddah and you know a talent like like Ollie Behrman doesn't so as Aaron said it does make the teams look pretty silly when you've got drivers in there who are miles off their teammates who are making errors you've got someone who comes in with no preparation and makes you know some of the f1 drivers look like they're the the juniors they're the amateurs so really really impressive weekend all round for him just a shame that it's done him no good in terms of the f2 standings we're going to get on to that we're going to get on to that and just quickly before uh, we move on on ollie behrman um for, for me, anyway, he, he was already kind of, uh, you know, in line for a Haas F1 seat. I think they, they were talking about how, uh, how how much they rated him from his FP1 appearance last year. Um, does this put him in the shop window for, a, for an F1 drive, maybe at Haas, even more so, Lawrence, in your opinion? Definitely, definitely. I think that if you look at a talent like Behrman, I think, you know, for him to be in that Ferrari driver programme, and for him to not get a Formula One seat next season, I think would be a massive, massive failure of that of that program. They have the talent there, and they absolutely need to to use it. You know, having no no rookies in Formula One this year has been a real, real shame. And you know, the the teams, quite frankly, just need to do a better job of promoting that talent. And if you can't see the talent in Ollie Behrman, then who are you gonna gonna put in that team? And you know, not to do any disrespect to, to Haas, but, you know, you look at a team that is relatively far back towards the field. If he does have a year where he just gets used to it, makes errors, you know, it's far less consequential than if he's in a Ferrari full, full time. So I don't see why you don't use a team like Haas to, to invest and give him that time to develop. Because also, as we've seen this weekend, he's ready to deliver. It's not like he would spend the entire season getting up to speed in Haas. He would be able to deliver from race one, just like he did. You know, give him a whole winter, even just an FP1 and FP2 to prepare, and look what he can do compared to this weekend. So absolutely, it would be an absolute travesty if he's not in Formula 1 next season. Mm, absolutely. Bravo, Oli Behrman. Uh, let's talk about the on-track action in F2 this weekend then, because it was absolutely sensational, as always, in Formula 2, wasn't it? Last week, it was the boy from Barbados. This week, Aaron, it's the boy from Brazil, wasn't it? It was a great drive by Enzo Fittipaldi to win the feature race. It was excellent, wasn't it? He started P4, obviously promoted a place because of Behrman's withdrawal, having taken pole position. And his race was fantastic. After the pit stops, he was a few seconds behind Kushmini. And I thought, you know, Miney's got this under control. And within about two or three laps, bam, Fittipaldi's there going past and taking control of this race. And not only did he take control of the race, he had to battle through after that late safety car. And the move for the lead was just unbelievable, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> just it was incredible. It was, it was so reminiscent of what happened at um, one of the restarts in 2021 in the Formula One race in Saudi Arabia, where you're just thinking the guy on the outside is just going to get collected. There's going to be a pinch point and it's just all going to go wrong. But first of all, fair play to Fittipaldi for having the, the courage to go for that, but also to Correa and to Amory Cordiel, who were on the inside and in the middle of it all, to keep their noses clean, no contact. Everyone came through unscathed. One of those moments where you go, you hold your breath, and then you come back out the other side. Everyone's got through. You've seen this amazing overtake, and it's just this 
sheer elation of, wow, what have I seen? That is absolutely outrageous. And then Frenzo to go and put seven, eight seconds on everybody else. It was just a fantastic performance. And he's threatened this ever since his Charouze days. And he was putting that car in places it really shouldn't have been, to be honest, picking up top fives and near podiums. Obviously, last year, he got his breakthrough win in the sprint race in Spa. But this was the real moment of Enzo Fittipaldi saying, I'm here. I am a top level F2 driver. And it, it is another case of a, a few seasons for it to come together. And obviously, he might have found the right place for him at VAR. So you know, you, you can't discount that. But it's been brewing with Enzo, hasn't it? We, we've seen it coming for a while. We've talked about him with those flashes of brilliance, that Brazilian flamboyance that we we all love. Wouldn't it be great to have a Brazilian driver on the F1 grid and also bring the Fittipaldi name? I mean, I'm, I'm getting misty-eyed here. The Brazilian name coming back, the Brazilian driver. Gosh, stop me here, lads, because I'm going to just burst into tears. It's the, the storylines that are alongside it are fantastic. And obviously for, for Enzo, it was a very emotional win because obviously his, his uncle Wilson had passed away recently. So it was a really nice moment for him to dedicate it to, to Wilson post-race. And there'll be a great moment for the family as well. And he, he just drove brilliantly. <laughs> that's, that's the only way you can sum it up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, as you say, a, a, a real touching moment. So you can see how emotional he was uh, in his uh, interview after the race. So, yeah, an amazing win for, for Enzo Fittipaldi. And I was with you going back to the, the double overtake. I was like, oh, he's going to go for the move. Is, is that going to be, you know, go past Cordell? I was like, oh, he's got both of them. There, That is a, yeah, a double move. Got both of them around the outside. Uh, absolutely superb move. And, uh, yeah, definitely uh, one worthy of a feature race win. Um, Lawrence, as Aaron's just touched on there, VAR, uh, winners again only the second time they've won a race um, in Formula 2 um, but you know that was on pure pace that win wasn't it um, our VAR um, you know they've, they've, it's their first season in the sport they've been building they've been building they won a race last year with Richard Vashore, Richard Vashore at Spielberg uh, what, what can VAR do this season and, and, and are we looking at VAR and Zoe Fittipaldi is that a potentially title contending um you know, duo combination. We we saw um, uh, Felipe Drogovic and Frederick Vesti start their title uh, contending campaigns in Jeddah. A VAR and Enzo Fittipaldi a, t- a potential title contending uh, duo. I, th- I think they definitely have to be in in that conversation this season. You know, after after that kind of a performance around a, a track like this. But you look at you know where VAR have been in the past. You know, the days where they'd have you know. One driver up there, good pace, particularly tyre management was something they they really struggle with. And you'd see, you know, Jake Hughes dropping back through through the pack and, you know, really not quite a- achieving to the same level they have in, in other series. Because, you know, VAR are a, are a team with proper pedigree in the, in the feeder series. And there is a lot of knowledge in that team. So it's really no surprise to see them performing like they are now. And... Absolutely, they can go on and make this more of a regular occurrence this year. It remains to be seen if they will be right up there to the end. You know, just doing one round in, in Formula Two as, as they've done isn't is never enough. But you know, the early signs are, are really good. So if they keep this up, absolutely they can compete for the title. But as we've seen time after time, it's so easy for a team to be right up there one weekend and nowhere the next. So. Just getting that consistency, um, you know, like we always say, is is absolutely key. So, come back to me with that one after after Melbourne, and we'll we'll see. I will. Don't you worry. Um, great weekend for VR and Enzo Fittipaldi. And I said last week, let's see those Barbados flags in the comment. Let's see those Brazilian flags in the comment. I know there's plenty of you who are Enzo Fittipaldi fans. I want to see those Brazilian flags in the comments. Uh, yeah, drop them, drop them in there. Um, I'll, yeah, Kush Miney then. P2, uh, good weekend. Uh, pole position. Um, yeah, Aaron, I want to talk about Kushmani and how good his weekend was. But I also want to talk about the fact that he got the two points for pole position uh, and your thoughts on that, because uh, Oli Behrman obviously did get the pole position. Uh, Kushmani inherited it and got the two points. Uh, yeah, talk to me about uh, Kushmani's weekend. It's been a wild couple of weekends for Kush, hasn't it? He was superb in Bahrain, took pole, had it taken away from him, had a decent pair of races, comes to... Jeddah sticks it on the front row, uh, then gets promoted to pole position and comes away with a podium. On the 
pole position points. So the, the, the rules say is the driver who lines up on pole position on feature race Sunday, essentially when they publish the grid ahead of the race, the person given pole position then is given the two points. So let's say a driver has a 10 place, five place grid penalty and then goes on and gets pole position. They get then demoted and they don't get the points. The person who qualifies second does. Here is a quirk of the rules working against a driver through no fault of his own. Obviously, Kush is the beneficiary of it. You would like to have seen maybe a little bit of common sense prevail and that Behrman, hang on, this isn't him being penalised. He's actually going on and doing something above the sport, what the sport is there to do. Um, but obviously, for Kush, it's great for his championship because technically Oliver Behrman wasn't in the race. So, yeah, for Kush, it was thoroughly well earned in terms of he did the second fastest time. His weekend this weekend was uh, very, very strong, actually. He did a decent job in the sprint race, got a another promotion to P8. <laughs> There's a lot of like people finishing in places, and then it all just shifts around again <laughs> this season. <laughs> it's, the, it's the only thing that's consistent about F2 at the moment is you just don't know what's going to happen next. Um, but the, the feature race, he was excellent in those early stages, built a nice lead. Actually, the safety car on lap one really hurt him because he was off like a, sh a bullet out of a gun. He was f just gone, absolutely flying. And then, I thought, like I said earlier, I thought he had it sort of s sewn up after the pit stop, but he didn't quite have the race pace to match Enzo Fittipaldi. But that said, he was positive about it post-race. He's got a podium in Victor's first of the season. His first of the season lays down a bit of a marker. He started the season really strongly last year. Hopefully he can carry that on through the mid-season and keep himself in contention. I think if he gets that first race win, we'll see Kushmani come alive. Yeah, his highest uh, finish in Formula 2, 20 points with the uh, pole position points included in that. I think he'll be quite happy with that uh, from this weekend. I'm just interrupting the podcast because I want to talk to you about motorsporttickets.com and I promise you, you're not going to want to miss out on this one. As the motorsport season starts, now is the best time to secure your tickets before they start to go up in price or to sell out. Motorsporttickets.com have a huge variety of different tickets from Formula 1 race weekends, which of course include Formula 2 and Formula 3, the World Endurance Championship, MotoGP, Le Mans 24 Hours and so many other events that are going on in the world of motorsport. Get your tickets fast now by following the link in the description to see all of their exclusive offers. Right, back to the podcast. Uh, Lawrence, another driver who should be happy from this weekend, Dennis Hauger. A podium in the feature race, a win in the sprint race. Uh, and yeah, him and MP looked quick, didn't they? Yeah, they've they've looked really quick and consistent so far this season. He's been he's been there or thereabouts in Bahrain and now in Jeddah, which is a really, really good sign because they're such different circuits. You know, the high deg degradation of Bahrain, and, you know, the much smoother surface in Jeddah where, you know, you've got a mix of real high speed corners, really long straights, some some tight ones as well. So to be quick on both those circuits is really good. And what an incredible finish he had to that feature race, you know, out dragging Crawford and Cordiel on the very, very last straight. You know, think, you know, think that scene in, in Cars where Lightning McQueen has to stick his tongue out to, to over the line to win it. That's, that's exactly what happened. Al almost pretty much. If you watch it back, that's almost essentially what happened. You can imagine, I think uh, Alex Brendel was saying, you can imagine Halga sort of crouching Definitely. down in the seat, yeah. trying to get, trying to push it across the line. Um, it was just one of one of the most iconic race finishes we've we've seen in, in Formula Two. And you know, there's been a good few. You know, you look look, look at Bottas on on Stroll back in Baku, I think 2018. That was this was you know three wide across the line. I had no idea who'd won at the time you just couldn't tell it was that close um you know what fantastic drama and for him to have the experience to position the car just right and get the drive out of that final corner you know could that you know be crucial come the end of those season those last you know thousands hundreds of a second make all the difference for him i love that you referenced yeah. the, the cars um scene there because that's exactly the gift that our social media um, person, uh, Carla, used on the Inside F2 X Twitter, whatever it's called now, uh, page, which uh, give a cheeky plug, at Inside F2. Go and follow it. Smooth. 
I like it. Go and check us out on uh, X, Twitter, Instagram, um, and uh, and Discord as well. Come and get involved in our our, uh, our community on Discord as well. We're talking Formula Two all of the time, which is awesome. Um, yeah, so it was Dennis Halger who did get that final podium, just pinched it off of Henri Cordill, who we're going to talk about in a minute, and Jack Crawford off the line. A quick word on Jack Crawford, Lawrence. Um, yeah, good, uh, good, good, another good weekend for him. He's actually been someone who he's had the pace again both weekends. He's uh, been a little bit unlucky at times, hasn't he? Yeah, he, he definitely has. And, and but he was able to perform so consistently this this weekend, you know, fifth in the sprint, despite being tagged by Antonelli at the start and managing to recover and a really yeah. solid fourth in the feature race and, you know, was was so close to, to, to getting the podium. He's really shown that 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 character and that that class that he, he showed at points last season. And just the the bravery as well, both in the sp- sprint and the feature race, overtaking through a very high speed section of the middle sector. You know, he just went and made moves where there shouldn't be moves into into turn twenty two, long, long, narrow, sort of twisty, almost straight, and he just put the car up the inside, full commitment and made some some wonderful moves and you know made made some crucial moves at crucial times to get into those positions so you know if he can just hold that that form and, and build on it you know he'll be looking at putting him, himself in the in the in the title conversation as well Definitely. Um, as we said, uh, Henri Cordille was obviously involved in that uh, rush to the line, uh, just missed out. He, yeah, it was an interesting strategy call, wasn't it? Because he went on the softs and Taylor Barnard also went on the softs until the end of the race. Uh, he did what Taylor Barnard couldn't uh, and made the softs last until the end of the race. And there was a point, Aaron, where I thought, well, hang on a minute, we could see Henri Cordille on the podium here. Uh, but yeah, he's, he, he equals his best uh, position or best finish in Formula 2. Uh, with a, a good drive yeah it was a, a roll of the dice moment wasn't it in the pits because we, we saw the top three all come in and uh, J.M. Correa decided not to box because they were still sort of 12 laps from the end and the soft the super soft tyres were the, the kind of tyre that you show a racetrack and they just, just decide they don't want to they don't want to racetrack anymore the original Pirelli tyres if you if you remember all the way back to 2011 that, that kind of vibe so for Amory Cordell to take them all the way to the end in a fairly competitive state, I think actually shows how much he's learned over his first two seasons as an F2 driver. Taylor Barnard, a rookie, maybe made some errors, but it's a great learning opportunity for him. Actually, here's what not to do when you're in a position to t- and you need to take the tyres all the way to the end. Amory did a fabulous job. It's a shame that he missed out on that podium because it would have been really richly deserved and the, the the risk with the strategy would have paid off beautifully with the podium, but he just got pipped by by Dennis on the line. Um, that's, that's racing, unfortunately, but still P4, matching his best result. And that's a great result for high tech as well, because they're, they're one of these teams that sort of fluctuate from being really fast at the front, and sometimes they, they're a little bit nowhere. They're a little bit Marmite in that sense. They, they can be really good or really bad. Um, so really good for them to get some, some solid points. And you know, it's good to see Cordill up there and showing his racing ability because sometimes he's, he's not quite as far up the order and we don't get to see it. Yeah, definitely. And I, I was gutted as well for J.M. Correa because there was a point where, you know, if, if he had uh, you know taken the gamble like Cordill did, he was ahead of Cordill at the time, so he could have been competing for the podium as well. And how brilliant would that have been to see uh, J.M. Correa on the podium after all that he's been through uh, in his, uh, yeah, his career as well would have been brilliant. Uh, hopefully we see that again at some point soon. Um, guys, I want to talk about Prima. Uh, a much better weekend for them and a much better weekend for Kimi Antonelli Lawrence. Do you, do you think it helped him that uh, with Oli Behrman in Formula One doing his thing, all of the focus, all of the attention was on Antonelli uh, from a team perspective. And maybe he, he he learned a little bit and benefited from it all being about him this weekend. I think I think maybe. I think he probably would have still, you know, enjoyed the the buzz off the off the team that would have been right up there at the front and, you know, learning from his from his teammate. But to have a, a weekend, I suppose, just to display his own own talents was was great for him. And, you know, to see him be so aggressive is really encouraging you know 
I think to come in as a rookie, you might be forgiven for you know just taking it slow and then building up from there, dialing it up. And what he's actually done is gone in and gone, I'm going to be aggressive from from the first race. We saw him racing Bem and pretty hard in Bahrain. And, you know, he was he was very aggressive in Jeddah and maybe just going get to that point, dial it back slightly. But I think that that must be so much easier to do as a driver than to go in and have to build confidence and then try to pull out that those kinds of audacious moves out of nowhere. So for him to have have started as he means to go on and then, you know, show the other drivers that, you know, there is a reason that he's being hyped up that he's not going to be a pushover this season is is brilliant and great for him to display the the pace that Prima have once again. And I think probably does reflect well on him because, you know, if, if Behrman had been starting from pole and won that race, you know, we would have perhaps looked at the gap to, to Antonelli and sort of seen, you know, that he does still need to make a lot of progress. But, you know, all, all in all, a really good weekend for him and hope to build through that and Prima to build because they just didn't deliver a car that you know either of their drivers could particularly work with in in uh in uh in Bahrain so yeah better things to to come for them and Antonelli I'm sure Aaron I know you we were talking on the uh Inside F2 Discord uh page and, and, and you were saying uh you know Antonelli is not holding back here he was really getting stuck in wasn't he he's not shy about coming forward is he Old Kimi Antonelli, I say old, he's, he's 17. <laughs> but yeah, he, he he gets stuck in. And I think he's, I, I think it was Alex Jake said on the commentary, you know, it's kind of similar to Oscar Piastri, who kind of learned the championship in the first half of the year and then just walked it the second half of the year. We might see something similar with, with Kimi, but the, the quality of the, the, of the opposition is really, really high. And obviously, arguably none more so than in, the other car at Prima in Oliver Behrman, who is officially a Formula One driver, by the way. And uh, it's great to see Kimi coming straight in from Frecker and being so aggressive, being competitive. It did reflect that Prima had a better weekend. There's obviously still things for him to learn, um, you know, sort of the, the race craft in terms of where he positions his car to, to make the most of his opportunities to, to get the moves done because he could be a bit more efficient in the way he comes through the field. But generally his pace was really good. So, Let's bear in mind, it's only his fourth race with this machinery as it is for everyone else, but at this level as well. So there's still lots to learn for Kimi and it will all come. And I'm sure we'll see him on the podium if it's not the top step, then uh, very, very shortly. Pace was good. Uh, the same can't be said for ART and Victor Martins this weekend. Uh, and that is nothing against Victor Martins. because We know how good Victor Martins is. What on earth is going on there? I mean, Victor Martins, 18th in the standings after two rounds with zero points, Lawrence. What is going on at ART? Well, let's not forget this is the same team that won the drivers and the team's title last year. And they had two drivers, they had the, you know, Porsche winning the title for them. And Martins was not very far off him at all last season. So consistently in the top five of qualifying last year and was probably most people's favourite for the title this year as someone who showed such maturity and consistency in their rookie season, staying with a team that, you know, proved their quality. And it just hasn't happened. And not only were they off the pace in the first race, but he was actually off the pace of his teammate O'Sullivan in in uh, in Bahrain. So, you know, they've got not much time to figure out what's going wrong and, and to fix it because the rest of the te- the the field is going to pull away. You know, the only saving grace perhaps is that one of the biggest dangers for the title, Oli Behrman, is sitting down there at the bottom of the standings with no points after after missing missing out. You know, well not missing out this weekend. I don't feel I don't think he'll feel like he missed out on anything particularly. But you know, we certainly missed missed not seeing him in a Formula Two car as wonderful as it was to see him in F one. So they've got a lot of work to do to get back to where they they should be to be eighth in the constructors' title. Just isn't isn't good enough for them as a, as a team. 
Okay, moving on to our new feature, Rookie Watch. We did it last week. We're going to do it again this week. And the driver I want to highlight on Rookie Watch this week is Rafael Villagomez. Uh, points for him, Aaron. Uh, a point. Uh, no, two points even. Two points for Rafael Villagomez. Uh, he got promoted because Josh Dirksen uh, got a 10-second penalty, uh, which took him outside the points. Unfortunate for him. Uh, but yeah, Villagomez, two points. Yeah, neat and tidy job. Uh, more points for VAR. So... You can't say fairer than that. Kept his nose clean. Very easy to have an accident in general. Be caught up in someone else's accident. So, you know, fair play. You know, it's not easy going to a, a really high speed street circuit as a rookie. And I think largely they kept themselves very honest in terms and very respectable in the way they conducted themselves. And Rafael going and scooping a couple of points in what was quite a hectic feature race. Fair play. Definitely. Uh, Lawrence, a couple of, yeah, as Aaron said, they, they, the rookies did well. I think you could see this weekend in comparison to Bahrain, Jeddah is a completely different ball game uh, to, uh, yeah, Bahrain, like we saw a couple of weeks ago. Difficult weekends for Miata. Uh, Bortoleto obviously had a, a difficult, so, well, uh, I don't know what happened at the start in the in the feature race. Uh, Marty was involved in an incident. Aaron obviously got taken out by Victor Martins at one point. Colo Pinto didn't finish the uh, feature race, contacts with the wall. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, a few difficult weekends, a few difficult feature races there for, for some of those rookies. They'll, they'll learn a lot from that, won't they? Yeah, they, they definitely will. And like you say, you really notice the difference between Bahrain, which is quite a, a wide open circuit, and such a tight, unforgiving circuit in Jeddah. It really bites, and a lot of drivers found that out. You know, Pepe Marti, you know, dropping it on, turn, on the exit of turn two in the feature race, you know, which also ended... Roman Stanek's race as well, which was such a shame to see. And, you know, slightly embarrassingly for him, you know, he thought he'd been taken out at the start on the on the radio, but, you know, he'd managed to drop it all on his own just with the, that heavy fuel load, cold tyres, you know, trying to get the power down, trying to get out of that corner before, before someone else overtakes you. It's so, so easy to do. And, you know, Franco Colapinto learned how, you know, sharp those barriers are. It was, wasn't the biggest of, of taps on that wall, but enough to you know to cause irreparable damage and send him spinning at turn one, and you know you look even at O'Sullivan you know spinning and, and losing the engine at, at, at turn one, turn two as well, and you know it, it is a, a round where it's going to be difficult for for rookies because of how unforgiving the circuit is, and we, they definitely a few of them got found out, but they will have learned a lot from that, but you know. We talk about being hard for rookies, unforgiving circuit. That just puts into context how impressive Oli Behrman's clean drive in Formula One was, that it is so easy to make an error on this track. But he didn't. Just on uh, Gabriel Bortoletto, his issue was a drive shaft issue that the team say they hadn't encountered before. So it, it was a really bizarre start for Gabriel, wasn't it? He was trying to accelerate, but the one side of the car was just literally blowing smoke. So... Uh, a real, a real big shame for him, but um, you know, Brazil still, still has something to celebrate come the end of that race. I'm really, really disappointing to see that, actually. I feel like we've seen quite a lot of reliability issues so far this season with that new new Formula 2 car. You know, there's going to be teething problems. It's just a shame we've seen, you know, in several cases now, it you know, interfering with with the race result. Even if you look at something like Miney in terms of them setting up the specifics of this new car and getting that slightly wrong and, you know, seeing him kick to the back of the field in Bahrain, you know, we kind of want these small things to get out of the way soon because, you know, they can make a massive impact on the title. It'd be a shame for someone to be out of contention because of reliability. Yeah, it's still early days with the new car, isn't it? Hopefully we can sort some of those teething issues and we don't see uh, that impact the championship. It's definitely not what we want. Um, Aaron, um, 50% of the votes on Twitter for our driver of the round went to Enzo Fittipaldi. He was clearly the fans' uh, driver of the round. Who was your driver of the round? Uh, I think Enzo Fittipaldi is probably the, the choice I'd have to make simply for that overtake. A race-winning move worthy of winning any race. Mm. Not just an F2 feature race. That could win an F1 race, a Le, a Le Mans 24-hour, an Indy 500 it could win you any race simply just for the ballsiness of it, I suppose. It was pure courage and it was so much high risk, but it was absolutely astronomical reward. And, and he got the reward. It was fair play 
and he was also just fantastically quick through the race. So, yeah, I agree with the uh, the fans who have also voted. Lawrence, you both went with Zane Maloney last week, which is completely understandable because he did the double. Uh, Aaron has gone Renzo Fittipaldi, so I'm going to push you to go for someone else. Uh, who was your driver of the round other than Enzo Fittipaldi? I think I might have to go for Dennis Halger. To see him so consistent throughout the weekend, you know, winning the sprint, getting on the podium, and the, the way in which he did it was absolutely fantastic. And, and, you know, one of those iconic F2 memories that we'll have, I'm sure, um, you know, but, you know, you, you mentioned Maloney there. I can't believe we haven't spoken about him mm, yet. Yeah. You know, he also had a good weekend after what was a pretty awful qualifying session. I think qualifying 16th and moving up to 15th after, after Behrman, you know, didn't start. To be able to get points in both of those races from 15th on the grid shows that there's some real quality and some real pace in that car so an impressive weekend from from him too i think not to be not to be overlooked but i think dennis hauger is my my pick just for that iconic last last few meters of the circuit overtake as it was brilliant yeah absolutely amazing moment definitely one we'll look back at the end of the season as uh, yeah one of the moments of the season i'm sure enzo fitterpaldi your driver of the weekend with 50 percent of the votes on our twitter at inside f2 uh, and uh, var also winning the team of the weekend vote as well you voted them as your team of the weekend with 39 percent of the votes okay let's take a look at the championship standings before we go then Zane Maloney maintains his lead after round two, despite a difficult qualifying session for him. He recovered well in both races, though. Enzo Fittipaldi's feature race win catapults him up the standings to P2, and a sprint race winner, Dennis Hauger, moves up to P3. Paul Aron, highest place rookie in P4. He'll be happy with his weekend's work. Zach O'Sullivan and Kimi Antonelli round out the top 10. And the team standings? Roden still lead the way, but the gap is down to seven points from Invicta Racing. They'll be hoping to maintain that next time out in Australia. VAR move up to fifth in the standings following their win this weekend. ART and Prima still down in eighth and ninth. They'll be hoping for better next time out as well. PHM, the only team yet to get off the mark. That's all we got time for today then. If you've enjoyed the show, please make sure you give it a like. As we said at the start of the podcast, subscribe for more Formula 2 content. We're going to have lots of content coming your way in between uh, here and Australia, but also through the rest of the season as well. And get involved in the comments as well. I definitely want to hear what you guys have to say about this weekend's action in Jeddah. Get involved. Let us know in the comments. But from me, Fraser Ford, and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time.